This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now, he puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGall. Uh, I feel like, as per usual, this show was well ahead on asking questions that many people didn't seem terribly interested in. I will give our friend Emerald Robinson credit for asking this question. But I was asking this question in year one in first months of the Biden (coughs) presidency. When the husk (coughs) became president of the United States. We're all supposed to pretend. Um, I have asked and asked and asked and made huge points of this. And perhaps it's because of the region I broadcast and I know that uh, Philadelphia International Airport is regularly, the airspace is regularly interrupted for what in there, Fast Eddie? Ah, the Joe, the Joe Jam, the visits from the Biden That's president. what they're called in Philadelphia, Joe Jams. And I have, how many times over the last two years now, heading into three years, have I mentioned that this guy's official business is constantly taking him through Pennsylvania. Like, everything he does is Pennsylvania-centric. I'm going back to Scranton. I'm going into Philadelphia for a big rally. He had his big uh, Insurrection Day rally in front of Independence Hall. Everything the man does, nine out of ten times. Well, he went to the wall briefly for a, for a half a second, but he got right home. Have I not constantly been saying that the guy's travels do only one thing, all roads lead back to Wilmington. I've been saying it since his very first days. And I don't know if people just kind of thought, I don't stick all, I'm not sure what thread you're pulling on that sweater. I don't know where you're going with that. I don't know why you think that's a thing. And I said, because it's strange. Why does he have to keep going home? Well, Trump went to Mar-a-Lago. Not like this. Not like this. I, yes, they all go to Camp David and Bush had the ranch and Obama and shit, whatever. I, like everybody has a house. I don't begrudge presidents spare time. It was noticeable that on almost day one, Joe Biden was leaving the White House on Thursdays and running back to Wilmington. And oftentimes they would mask it by him going on official business. Boy, tr- and remember how they'd say he's hitting the trail. And I'd say, hitting the trail, he's going to Philadelphia again. Hitting the trail is not Philadelphia. Hitting the trail is going to Sacramento or something. Hitting the trail is going to Oregon. Hitting the trail, even go to o- Oklahoma or so, you know, New Mexico. Hit the trail. He'd hit the trail and run up the road to a town close to whatever was closest to I-95. Whatever would take him right back to Wilmington. And every time, that's what he did. I've been shouting this for two years. Why does he keep making trips to Pennsylvania and then immediately beelining home? I've been driving down to Pennsylvania Turnpike. I've witnessed Air Force One circling. I've, uh, there, uh, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, there is a balloon event there every year, which has had to be canceled in previous years. Because the husk is constantly flying home to Wilmington and they ground all airspace so that the husk can fly in and out. Why? I kept saying. And people were like, I don't know, Stigall, there's bigger fish to fry. Why are you, what's a big deal about him going home to Wilmington? And now all of a sudden, here we are in year number three and everyone's very concerned about these visitor logs in Wilmington. I don't know. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, I um, the show is just so damned advanced, it's too advanced for its own good, I guess. It gets frustrating. There are no visitor logs for President Biden's home in Wilmington, Delaware, the White House Counsel's Office said in a Monday statement. That's what the Republicans all want now. They want visitor logs in Wilmington. And I kept saying, there are no visitor logs in Wilmington. Who's he talking to in Wilmington? We've been asking and asking and asking. This goes back to when Emerald was in the White House press corps and she asked this question. In fact, I don't know if we can go back and I didn't prep you for this, Eddie. I don't know if we have that in the archives. But I know this goes back to Circle Back Girl Jen Psaki's days. And Emerald used to annoy Jen Psaki because she was the only the only one in the press corps 
who would say, why is Biden constantly going back to Wilmington? And it was always dismissed as, well, the presidents have their home and their free time. They deserve a little downtime. No, more than half his free time, more than half his weekends. In fact, I think there was a story done on this, like two thirds of his weekends he's spending in Wilmington and not at the White House residence. Why? Now they want to know, now that they've been finding documents in the garage next to the Corvette and classified documents being used as coasters, they want to know who else has been there in Wilmington. And I'm like, well, welcome to the party, gang. I've been asking what the hell's going on in Wilmington for the last two years. Republicans on Capitol Hill demanding visitor logs. Following revelations, Biden's lawyers discovered a stash of classified documents inside the Holmes garage. While it's common practice to keep comprehensive visitor logs at the White House, Biden lawyers say there's no such record for his home in Delaware. We're not surprised by this. We've known this. Like every president in decades of modern history, his personal residence is personal, said the White House counsel's office. But upon taking office, President Biden restored the norm and tradition of keeping White House visitor logs, including publishing them regularly after the previous administration ended them. Right. So they're keeping better records at the White House, but he's never at the White House. So you should. (laughs) Hey, we're very buttoned up here at the White House. Yeah, but he likes to go home. He's always traveling to Wilmington. That's what we're asking about, where he stores all the documents. Yeah, well, we don't keep. That's his private residence. I see. So, uh, folks, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't know where that's going to go, if it's going to go anywhere. But one thing that is really becoming a delicious thread to the sweater, if you will, that's unraveling quickly, is what Donald Trump Jr. pointed out on Twitter last night. Hunter has no problem paying $50,000 a month in rent to dad, but he has a hard time paying child support. This Hunter Biden... Not that I have to tell you, this is not breaking news. What a scumbag this one is. Do you know that he's actively fighting in court right now because his hooker, sorry, not hooker, no disrespect to you in the adult entertainment profession, the stripper, uh, (laughs) you know, Hunter knocked up a stripper, right? And they have a kid together. Bidens don't claim this kid. The Bidens don't acknowledge that this kid exists. This would be, I think, Biden's seventh grandchild, and he doesn't acknowledge her. Hunter refuses. He doesn't, he's been fighting to pay for it. He doesn't want to pay for the child. Well, now the mom, the baby mama, have you heard this? They want to legally change the baby's name to Biden. Guess who's fighting it? Hunter. Hunter is in court right now fighting the stripper, the baby mama, Doesn't want to legally change the last name to Biden. She says because uh, the Biden name will give her advantages and power and make her uh, feel like she has a future and all of this stuff. (laughs) And Hunter says, oh, no, no, no. The Biden name is far too burdensome and will bring too much attention to her. (laughs) But Trump Jr. is right. What a scumbag. He listed. So here's the thing about this $50,000 in rent deal. Hunter has claimed on some kind of uh, real estate form, he was trying to, I still can't figure out if he's trying to buy or rent, doesn't matter, but I think he was trying to buy a house. And so he lists dad's home, we went over this yesterday, in Wilmington, the one that grandpa's constantly going back to every weekend. He's been listing this as his home, but he's also listing it as a place he rents. So at a minimum, folks, what's happening here at a bare minimum is mortgage fraud. I mean, this guy continues to be caught in fraud, literal fraud and committing felonies. That's the son. But here's the problem. If that's true, that he's paying $50,000 a month to dad for rent, which I mean, who? I don't know about you. Maybe if you've got some teenagers and you're trying to teach them, you know, a thing or two like That's what's going to happen as soon as my 18-year-old graduates from high school. He's not entirely sure. You know, he wants to go on to college. And I said, maybe he's going to do the community college route for a couple of years to sort of, we're fine with that. What he doesn't know and what we're going to sit down and have a conversation about soon is the concept of rent. 
And we are going to have a discussion about, well, you're not just going to loaf around in the house. Like, we're going to set up a rent structure. He doesn't know what's coming, but I, that's coming. But, and he's not listening, so I feel confident in sharing this with you. The little trick is, and I think a lot of parents do this, you charge them the rent, you bank the rent they give you, and then you hand it back to them after a period of time and say, here you go. Good job. That's the, or maybe some of you pocket it. I, either way, I don't judge you. But the point is, you got to teach people a little something. But 50K? I don't, if my son's in a position where he can pay me 50K a month for rent, we're going to greatly upgrade Stately Stigall Manor. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> and I'm going to go to work for him. But nevertheless, they're very concerned about the White House not producing Wilmington, Delaware visitor logs. And I say to myself, um, I don't know where you've been. But okay, um, we'll get into this in more detail coming up with our uh, friend, the constitutional attorney. He was a spokesperson for the Department of Justice for a while, Mark Weaver, and uh, see what he thinks about it. Martin Luther King Jr. Day was yesterday. I didn't do an adequate job in recognizing that, and I apologize, because Martin Luther King Jr. himself was a very impressive man. A man who believed the antithesis of what the Democrat Party is. Content of character is more important than color of skin. If Martin Luther King Jr. were still alive today, uh, you cannot imagine, at least given the speeches that he gave, that he'd be a Democrat. Because this Democrat party believes in identity politics first. The color of your skin, the, your gender, your sexuality is far more important than any character you bring to the table. Do you check boxes is the new Democrat mantra. Furthest thing from Martin Luther King Jr. That's why it's so hard to sit through these people lecturing and talking about race and Martin Luther King Jr.'s history and legacy when you know they have done everything they can to savage and railroad the agenda of Martin Luther King Jr. But I digress. The Husk was at the National Action Network yesterday, and he led... This is so, this is so violently uncomfortable. I guess it was the, uh, was it the sister-in-law? Who, who were they singing happy birthday to? I forget who he was trying to acknowledge. It was, uh, it was Martin Luther King Jr.'s son's wife. Son's so, uh, wife. So it would have yeah. been his daughter-in-law. Martin Correct. Luther King Jr.'s daughter-in-law <laughs> was sitting at the table. It happened to be her birthday on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so Biden decides to lead the room... In happy birthday. One problem, though, he has no idea of this woman's name as he starts singing. Martin III, we celebrate a legacy of your beloved father and mother. They work for the beloved community. But congratulations today, the honorees, uh, including your wife, uh, who I understand uh, is a birthday today. Well, look, my wife has a rule in her family. On somebody's birthday, sing happy birthday. You ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Oh. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Valley. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday, dear Valley. I mean, it didn't even mask it. Like, at least pull the microphone away from your mouth. Happy birthday, dear... Her name is Andrea, I believe. A-R-N-D-R-E-A. And, of course, he brings it up as though he just thought of it. You know, like it wasn't in his prompter. Ah, and, uh, you know, memory serves. I can barely remember to put on pants, but uh, I think I know that... Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter-in-law is having a birthday today, right? Isn't that about right? I think I've got a you know, steel trap, this noggin of mine. You know, and we have a rule in my house. Jill, I, they have a lot of rules in their house. Sure. I don't even believe that. Do you believe that? He always says stuff like that. <sighs> Dr. Jill has a rule in their house. If it's, if it's somebody's birthday, they sing happy birthday. He's always saying that stuff. Happy birthday, dear heaven song. What an embarrassing buffoon, this guy. It starts off well, too. Doesn't even know. He can't work the mic. Is the mic? Is this on? Hello? I'm sure this is on. Is this on? Hello, hello, hello? 
Hello, no ho. Okay. <laughs> huh? Let me hear the, Let me hear him say his name, the name again. He doesn't know who he's singing to. Can you get into that? We celebrate a legacy of your beloved father and mother. They work for the beloved community. But congratulations today, the honorees, uh, including your wife, uh, who I understand uh, is a birthday today. Well, look, my wife has a rule in her family. When somebody's birthday, sing happy birthday. You ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Valley. <laughs> happy birthday to you. <laughs> dear Valley. Oh, but this is my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. story of the day <laughs> from the New York Post. Have you seen the statue unveiled in Boston called the Embrace? <laughs> uh, this is I'm reading this directly from the New York Post, so I'm warning you. If there are young children in your midst as you're listening to this. I'm warning you now, you have time to hit pause, turn it down, turn this off. I'm warning you, young ears, this is not a segment for you, but I'm reading it from the New York Post. This is not, not me editorializing, all right? Even some kin of Coretta Scott King hate the new $10 million sculpture just dedicated to her and her iconic civil rights leader husband in Boston. A cousin of the family <laughs> claims the new statue looks like a penis. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Fathomsmen. <laughs> the massive bronze piece. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, entitled The Embrace, features two sets of arms holding each other, an artistic interpretation. The, the, the bummer is this is a beautiful photo. If you've actually seen the photo of Coretta and Martin Luther King Jr. hugging after he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, it's a lovely photo. He's a handsome man. She's a beautiful young woman, and they're hugging. It's a beautiful picture. And, like, if you made a statue out of this beautiful photo, you'd go, oh, that's a lovely moment. What a nice statue. But it's just their arms. It's just hovering bronze arms in the air. That's all it is. It's like singular arms. There's no bodies. So from different angles, this statue looks... Ah. Sadly, Chris, like, even the Bud Light statue of <laughs> Doug Peterson and Nick Foles at the link... <laughs> But like if you did that of the picture, that would have looked much better than what what that is. The um, <laughs> Seneca Scott, Coretta Scott King's cousin, told the New York Post the mainstream media reporting on it like it was all beautiful. They were told to say that. <laughs> then, when it came out, a little boy pointed out, "That's a penis." And everyone was like, now, folks, I'm reading this. To, I'm warning you. This is from the New York Post. <clears throat> Direct quote. And everyone was like, yo, that's a big old dong, man. <laughs> yo. That's a big old dong, man. If you had showed that statue to anyone in the hood, they'd have been like, no, absolutely not. Ten million dollars wasted to create a masturbatory metal homage to my legendary family members, one of the great all-American families of all time. <laughs> That's a big old dong, man. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Habenfa. So that's how Democrats continue the tradition of honoring a legendary all-American family. 
phallic bronze statues and butchering names during birthday songs. By the way, one last note on this Wilmington visitor log thing that I didn't mention. One thing is true, despite the fact that they don't keep visitor logs at the Husk's house, here's what I do know. I know, I, I think anybody who has traveled to Washington, and if you've ever gone to the White House or anywhere near, no one comes anywhere near the President of the United States without the Secret Service doing a thorough vetting. So there are logs. There is no one, no one, including his family, that enters the perimeter with the President of the United States that the Secret Service doesn't know about. So as a matter of fact, while they may not keep, you know, there's, maybe there's not a book in the foyer at the Biden youth hostel they run for Hunter at 50K a month. Uh, maybe there's not a, you know, a sign-in book like a bed and breakfast, but the, the Secret Service does know who visits. I assure you of that. I mean, I've been to the White House when the president's not even in town. And, you know, I get a rectal exam like you wouldn't believe. So I don't, I don't believe for a second they don't know who comes and goes at the house in Wilmington. Happy birthday, dear husband. It's a big old dong, man. Bob Spinato, my dear friend, uh, and it's such a pleasure to call him my dear friend. In fact, I texted him yesterday when we launched this podcast in partnership with the Salem Media Group and the Salem Podcast Network. Uh, we're in day two, and I texted him. He was the first person I texted the information that it's official and a done deal and that we're now part of the Salem podcast family. And uh, the reason I did that is because Bob has been my first radio sponsor since I started my morning show in Philadelphia, and he was the very first sponsor of this podcast. That's true. Bob Spinato at Williamsburg Dental is not only an outstanding dentist, he is a gentleman, he's a principled guy, he's a kind guy, he's a loving family man, a father, and uh, in fact, his daughter now practices alongside him. How cool is that as the next generation of Spinatos? In Broomall, Pennsylvania, just off the Blue Route, if you're anywhere near the Philadelphia metropolitan area, this guy's worth the drive. And I know people that do from Florida and New York. They've even re relocated and they still go to Bob. He did my teeth, my cosmetic dentistry overhaul years ago. I still get compliments on today. He's tops in cosmetic dentistry in the region. He does an outstanding job, but he's also one hell of a great general dentist. So if you haven't been in a long time and you've put it off and you're afraid to go to the dentist, I understand it, and so does Bob. He's not going to judge you. He won't hurt you. A lot of people don't go to the dentist because they think it's got to be excruciating and judgmental and bad. It's not. You will love his staff. You feel like you're walking into a spa. I, I've never, ever had this kind of attention to detail, to my comfort, respect for my schedule. You're in the chair on your scheduled appointment time. You're not sitting around waiting. And a follow-up phone call. How cool is that from a dentist? A follow-up phone call. How you feeling? How you doing? Any discomfort? That's the Williamsburg Dental difference. That's Bob Spinato. Call 610-353-2700 to make an appointment. 610-353-2700 or williamsburg-dental.com. It always seems like um, after a few months pass, I've got to call up our friend Cam Edwards, editor at BearingArms.com and a host of the uh, podcast, Cam and Company. It, it's, it's never like every day or every week or even every month there's a gun story, but it seems like all of a sudden at once, a bunch of meddlesome Democrats, I don't know if they get together. I don't know if it's strategic. I don't know what it is, but it's like all at once, the gun regulation stories come raining down. I have... Four of them in front of me. I, I talked with you about New Jersey just before the, um, the new year. New Jersey passing new aggressive gun laws. And I knew right away that that would be challenged in court. It was. And a federal judge has blocked, as of yesterday, blocked a part of a newly enacted New Jersey law that prohibits guns from being carried in certain parts of the state. U.S. District Judge Renee Marie Bum in Camden, issued a temporary restraining order for a section of the law that specifically bans guns from being carried in public libraries or museums, bars or restaurants that serve alcohol and entertainment facilities. One catch-all provision barring guns from being carried on private property where the owner did not ex explicitly grant permission was also blocked, as was another section that prohibits guns from being carried in vehicles unless they are unloaded and stored in closed areas. So... That's good news. Um, a federal judge blocking a lot of this in New Jersey. Outrageous that anyone would try it. But similarly, in 
Uh, Illinois. Pritzker is now at war with a lot of sheriffs across the state of Illinois. J.B. Pritzker Tuesday signed one of the most extensive weapons bans in the country, outlawing the sale of nearly 170 so-called assault weapons. The Protect Illinois Communities Act bans the sale and distribution of certain pistol shotguns and rifles, including AR-15s. The law passed through the state's Democrat legislature also bans high-capacity magazines and switches that can make handguns fully automatic. A lot of sheriffs have gone to war with Pritzker, said, we're just not enforcing that around here. So Pritzker's now at war with uh, sheriffs. That's not going well. Cam Edwards to tell us more. I also have a story about the Supreme Court's Alito and Thomas talking about their serious concerns about Second Amendment questions, which we'll get into amendment, uh, in a minute. But Cam and New York is up to it again, too. So uh, the usual suspects, my friend. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Plus Massachusetts, Colorado, Washington State, California. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, and you, you talked, Chris, about uh, this sort of, you know, concerted effort here. I think this is a direct result of the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin. Uh, which, you know, reminded uh, gun control advocates that not only do we have a right to keep arms, we have the right to bear them as well. This is the third uh, really bad decision from the court as far as gun control advocates are concerned. So I think this is their reaction. This is their full court press. We're going to try to you know, ban carry as, in as many places as we can. We're going to try to make it as expensive as possible to get a carry license. And, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to try to ban, quote, unquote, assault weapons uh, in every blue state this year. Refresh us on the case, um, specifically the court case that you mentioned and why uh, it was a step backward on the Second Amendment. Yes. So this challenged New York's concealed carry laws, which uh, were known as sort of a May issue system, right? Meaning even if you pass all of the uh, background checks, you did all of the required training, you may get a concealed carry license or you may not uh, because it's up to the whims of the authorizing agent in the state. Well, that challenge or that policy was challenged in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You, you, you need to have a, a system that looks like what we have in places like Pennsylvania, a shall issue system, right, where there is no discretion on the part of a uh, judge or a police officer to say, eh, I don't like Chris. He doesn't get a license. Um, that's what was challenged. That law was overturned. And even though that law was only in place in like eight states, Gun control advocates know that's the writing on the wall, right? They've, they've lost their handgun ban in Heller versus D.C. Now they've lost on the right to carry in uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. So they are desperate uh, to try to figure out, uh, you know, how on earth to uh, keep going after our Second Amendment rights when the court keeps smacking them down. And, of course, you know, I, I, I've been joking about a story out of Philadelphia. A guy jumps out on the hood of his car uh, in the middle of, uh, you know, mid-morning traffic and starts firing a gun in the air. Um, and I just said, for fun, let's follow this one story. Just for fun. He's, he didn't kill anyone, thank God, but he jumps out of his car. He fires this gun into the air. He's arrested. Um, as I read it, uh, I don't think he's in legal possession of the gun. Now, in any sane world with all the laws on the books, that guy should be sent away and we not see or hear from him for a very long time, right? But we have a, a lunatic DA in Philadelphia who is probably not going to prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law. But if, if we did, I mean, that's, isn't that where we start? I know it's a cliche, but there are plenty of laws on the books that should aggressively deal with people like this. And Democrats continue to go to war with all of us who own guns. Well, that's yeah, I think you're right. And I think that one of the uh, the problems that Democrats have sort of boxed themselves into here, you know, going back several years, they're the party of defund the police. Uh, they're the party that, you know, wants to reimagine policing in the criminal justice system, which you'd think would make them opposed to creating a whole bunch of new nonviolent possessory crimes carved out of a constitutional right. But no, that, that that's the one blind spot they have, right, when it comes to uh, uh, prosecutions and the law. Um, and so we are in this weird spot where, you know, Democrats who say, oh, we've got, you know, the prison school to prison pipeline. We've got, you know, too many laws on the books. But we've got to put more on there, especially when we're dealing with legal gun owners. At the same time, 97 percent of felony cases in this country end up in plea bargains. And so guys like the one that you're talking about, rather than going to prison, will get probation, they'll get a slap on the wrist. And Democrats complain about the high violent crime rates. And, and, and again, their excuse and their answer is to target legal gun owners. Illinois, like so many other states, um, they have a lunatic Democrat management of their largest city in Chicago, which is disastrous and violent and deadly and all of those things. But Illinois is a lovely state 
outside of Chicago, full of very conservative, responsible gun owners and sheriffs who don't like any of this talk about going after guns. Um, but it's, you know, it, pick your state. Almost every state has Democrat policies on guns coming out of big, violent cities when the rest of the state is completely law-abiding and calm and peaceful and full of sheriffs who don't like this stuff. Yeah, sheriffs, and in the case of Illinois, uh, state's attorneys, prosecutors are now starting to get involved here. About nine out of ten sheriffs in Illinois have said that they will not enforce the state's new ban on so-called assault weapons or possessing, quote-unquote, large-capacity magazines. Um, at least they will not be arresting people solely for uh, breaking that law. And you've got a lot of state's attorneys downstate, right, outside of Chicago, who are saying, we're not going to prosecute these cases, even if the sheriff or a, a local jurisdiction brings these cases to me. So as you said, Prisker sort of insinuated that he had the power to remove sheriffs. He doesn't. Uh, Attorney General Kwame Raul came out yesterday and said, well, if these sheriffs don't do the job, somebody else will. Implying that maybe the state police will step in and, you know, enforce these laws in, in rural Illinois. Um I think they've really bitten off more than they can chew here. They passed a law that I believe is flagrantly unconstitutional. Uh, the vast majority of county sheriffs in the state of Illinois have said, yeah, we think it's unconstitutional, too. And we're not going to violate anybody's rights by arresting them for, uh, you know, possessing a magazine. And, Chris, getting back to what you talked about, you know, where, where serious crimes aren't getting prosecuted, the violation of the, the magazine ban, I believe, is a uh, Class 6 misdemeanor in Illinois. It's basically a low-level misdemeanor. The idea that violent criminals are going to be stopped by this law is absolutely absurd, right? They're out there committing violent felonies. And different guys like, well, if we just put this misdemeanor on the books, that, that should take care of the problem. It's obscene, <laughs> it's, a, it's obscene and insane. Yeah, talk about what New Jersey tried to do. I mean, a judge steps in, as I read off the top here. Uh, the judge stopped mm -hmm. this from going into, uh, they, like, they tried to ban guns from being carried in libraries, museums, bars, or restaurants that served alcohol and entertainment facilities. Uh, uh, carried in vehicles unless they're unloaded. Um, so a, ju a judge in Camden, New Jersey, stepped in and goes, uh, "You can't, you can't do that." Yeah, and and by the way, so New Jersey has banned concealed carry in a, in a whole lot more places, but yeah. this lawsuit uh, basically reached for the low hanging fruit. They they thought, okay, what are the most egregious violations? Let's get something in place. Let's get a TRO in place, and then we can build on that. But, yeah, I mean, think about what you just described for a second, Chris. <laughs> so if you are a concealed carry holder, you've gone through all of the hoops and hurdles. The state of New Jersey says, okay, fine, you get your license. We trust you to carry a gun. As soon as you leave your house and go to your car, you got to unholster the gun. you got to unload the gun. you got to tuck it away. Then when you get to where you're going, you got to make sure that they allow for concealed carry. And if they do, then you got to take the gun out of your, uh, uh, you know, compartment, put, holster it again. You know, it's, it's obscene. And, again, how on earth are people supposed to exercise their right to carry, which is what Judge Bump said, that these prohibitions, in essence, negate the right to carry because you can't carry anywhere without violating the law. Um, so it really turns the law on its head. It was a good decision, granting the TRO. We've got a request for a, uh, an injunction coming up from the judge. Uh, and there was another lawsuit that had been filed by a couple of other 2A groups that's now been uh, uh, joined up with this particular case called Coons. And so you've got this one big massive legal challenge uh, that is going to be heard in front of Judge Bum, who I think has demonstrated that she understands what these concerns are all about. And she actually has shown a respect for the Second Amendment, the, the respect that it deserves, quite frankly. Meanwhile, and I should point out to all of these gun um, grabbers that what they do when they do these things, all they, all they do is pour kerosene on the fire of gun sales. I, because every yeah. single one of these headlines just elicits more gun buying. It's through the roof, is it not, Cam? It really is. Yeah, we saw this phenomenon in Oregon back in uh, November after they passed Measure 114, and gun sales increased, I think, 400%. Uh, in Illinois, it was the same thing before this so-called assault weapons ban went into effect. I spoke with a gun store owner in De Plain, Illinois, and he said rifle sales were up 10 times what they were the year before. So a nearly a 1,000% increase in the sale of these guns that, you know, Democrats wanted to ban. Um, yeah, we see this phenomenon. Look, you tell Americans you can't have something, and there are a whole bunch of Americans who say, want to bet? Yeah. You know, and, and, and we see that with all kinds of things. But uh, it certainly holds true when it comes to our right to keep bear arms and commonly owned firearms. You know, I've moved out to sort of a rural part of the world, and uh, it's it's so funny. I will often congratulations. Yes, yeah, and I will often hear just um, 
random gun firing in the middle of the day, and I always think, there's a guy just just practicing. And I just love it. I love the sound. It's music to my ears. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I heard I heard this yesterday afternoon. In the first couple of shots, I thought, I thought deer season was over. And then I heard him just, you know, and bang, bang, bang. And I was like, oh, okay. He's, he's just practicing. That's yeah. Fine. No, I, um, yeah, I love hearing it. You know, opening day of deer season is great. <laughs> I love it. It is the sound of freedom. <laughs> and Cam Edwards is all about it. Uh, you will hear him talk about these issues and many more. Uh, BearingArms.com. He's the editor there, the podcast, Cam and Company. Cam Edwards, it is great to catch up with you again, my friend. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. You know, I'm not high maintenance and a snob about much, like when it comes to food and whatever. As long as it doesn't taste terrible, I'll eat it. Uh, but one thing that I am kind of a snob about Sheets and towels. And Mike Lindell and the MyPillow people have put a premium on comfortable sheets and comfortable towels that actually work. A towel that actually works. Wouldn't that be refreshing? Have you ever felt like a fluffy towel at the store? You bring it home and then uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't absorb anything. It's like you've dried off with nothing. It's not absorbent at all. What about a nice fluffy towel that, yes, is actually also absorbent? That's the MyPillow towel. And right now, Mike and the team at uh, MyPillow, for those of you who uh, listen to this podcast, as a, an official new sponsor of the podcast, they're giving you a heck of a deal on this beautiful set of towels. And you can pick multiple different colors to, uh, to choose from, a variety of colors. Right now, six pieces, a six-piece towel set, just thirty nine ninety eight, And all you have to do is use the promo code CHRIS to collect that deal, all right? So a six-piece set of towels that actually dry you and work in a bunch of different colors that could match your decor at MyPillow.com for just thirty nine ninety eight. All you got to do is use the po- promo, <laughs> easy for me to say, promo code CHRIS, all right? So MyPillow.com, and as always, as you know, Mike gives that 10-year warranty with all the MyPillow products and a 60-day money-back guarantee as well. So again, one more time, that six-piece set of MyPillow towels at MyPillow.com. Use the promo code CHRIS or call today, 800-932-5056. 800-932-5056 and tell them CHRIS as your promo code to get that deal. Okay, uh, Title IX religious exemption is not discrimination. This from Steve West. Christian colleges won a major victory in court when a federal judge dismissed a lawsuit that threatened the school's federal funding. April 2021, a group of LGBTQ plus students sued the Department of Education for exempting Christian colleges from non-discrimination rules. The lawsuit included personnel statements from students at universities such as Baylor, Bob Jones, Dort, and Union Colleges. Students described how colleges disciplined or expelled them for not abiding by standards for biblical sexuality, standards rooted in the school's religious beliefs. In a 40-page ruling, U.S. District Judge Ann Aiken, who's an appointee of Bubba's former President Bill Clinton, rejected a broad range of constitutional arguments made by the students. They contended that allowing religious schools not to follow non-discrimination rules of the federal Title IX law violated their right to equal protection and impermissibly advanced a religious viewpoint about marriage and sexuality. (laughs) I don't know how to break it to you lunatics, but marriage is a religious institution. It is defined in a religious context. Marriage is between a man and a woman as defined in Scripture. It is biblical. The institution of marriage is religious. You can't get around it. So you can call it whatever you want. You can call it getting hitched. You can call it civil unions. You can call we live together. We shack up. I don't give it any name you want. We've bonded. We've we've united. We've embraced. Call it whatever you want. But marriage is, by definition, a religious institution. And as such, I say again, it does not warrant federal intervention on any level. It doesn't it doesn't need federal protections or definitions. It also doesn't need, um, you know, to be nothing can nothing can be permitted or tolerated or court step in and sanction this or sanction that. The federal government has nothing to say, period, endorsing or denying marriage because marriage is, as defined, a religious ordinance. 
So these LGBTQ people who are mad that these Christian universities, these private Christian universities say, no, we define marriage as between a man and a woman. That's our Christian definition of it, and we're not going to do, we're not going to do it any other way. These LGBT students trying to attend, this is what's so insidious, and this is where these Christian institutions have held the line, God bless them, and this is where churches need to hold the line, and many aren't. But this judge said, no, religious schools get to adhere to their religion, and you don't get to come in and say, uh, your religion is discriminatory against me, and so you must stop adhering to and enforcing your religious ordinances on this campus. The judge said, no, that's what religion is. That's what freedom of speech is. That's what a First Amendment is. You cannot impose and force your will on people who don't, do not believe what you believe. So this is, I tell you what, these judges across the board, whether it's in New Jersey on guns, whether it's down in Florida on the Stop Woke Act, or whether it's this on the Title IX thing, that these LGBTQ activists are using, this is, you go back to the importance of judges. And frankly, I think a couple of the judges in these stories are not um, necessarily who you'd think traditional Republican appointed judges either. This argument went nowhere with Aiken. Students invoked substantive due process, a constitutional doctrine meant to, to protect from arbitrary infringement on liberty by the government. Aiken called their reasoning vague and con. Conclusory. I've heard that word. She criticized students' allegations that their freedom of speech was violated as difficult to string together and implausible. She dispensed with the argument that the religious exemption somehow impermissibly advanced religion, stating plaintiffs provide no developed analysis or facts to shed light on those assertions or explain how defendants have advanced religion through their own activities and influence. Nor did governmental action burden the religious beliefs of the students and violate the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Ryan Tucker, from our friends at Alliance Defending Freedom, represented the group of college students that joined the case. He said the Religious Exemption Accountability Project backed the former students in a broad push to pressure Christian schools. The project's parent organization... Uh, in its own words, seeks to sabotage Christian supremacy, including beliefs that gender is God-given. And this is the nut of it all. Sabotage, there is this ideology out there that Christianity is supremacy, and it must be torn down. And the notion that God is in control, God is on the throne, laws and ordinances are Judeo-Christian derived in this country. Obedience to law is liberty. Law is, is, you know, largely constructed. Baseline law in this country is of Judeo-Christian or, or, uh, origination. The Bill of Rights, natural rights, meaning gifted by God. If, you, if these people are successful in shredding that idea, Katie, bar the door, folks. If we lose the undergirding principle in this country that our rights are natural rights, gifted and granted by God. No man or woman has created these laws, and no man or woman can take them away. If these people, and they're doing it with guns in many states, as we just talked about with Cam, they're trying to attack it on the sexuality front and marriage. If they can go at this, your First Amendment right, your right to worship, your right to say that God is sovereign, that marriage is a religious ordinance, it is defined as a religious ordinance in Scripture, speech, assembly, if they can come at these things and say, no, 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 these are all gifts from man and these can be taken away or they're malleable by man, the Bill of Rights means nothing. And we're in a world of hurt. And thank God for now, for now, there seem to be judges, even in places like New Jersey, who understand self-defense. The Second Amendment is a natural right. There are judges appointed by Bill Clinton who understand, no, a religious institution does get to say that marriage is one man, one woman, that homosexuality is a sin. They get to say that whether you like that or not. And as such, that is the way they will conduct and govern themselves and that's not discriminatory. You have the right and option to not attend that university, but you cannot come into the university and kick down their door and make them change their ways for you and call them bigots. Not the way it works in the United States with the Bill of Rights. So good for these judges. 
right now, here again, it is the judiciary of these United States at this hour. I mean, we hope that this Republican, narrowly controlled Republican House, can at least do some investigative work and maybe halt some runaway spending. But it is the judiciary at this hour that is saving the United States, hanging by a thread. And, you know, I go back to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the guy who's <laughs> who's so responsible for so much of the federal judiciary being stocked with constitutionalists. We're fortunate. Now, I remind you that the United States Senate at present, run by Chuck Schumer and the Democrats, uh, they're not going to be able to do much, but one thing they are going to do is rubber stamp and uh, at present, you know, think of it like the meter in a taxi cab. Day after day after day, quietly, you're not going to hear about it. But these Democrats are cranking them out just as fast as they can to the federal judiciary. These senators holding hearings on judges, you're not hearing about it. But the Democrat left, this Katanji Jackson Brown at the Supreme Court, uh, people like her are going to, well, hell, even Biden can't say her name. Remember yesterday, he tried to invoke her. The point is, lots of people like her are, are being rubber stamped through the Senate right now. So the judiciary matters, and it matters big time. And it's got to continue to be a focus as we talk about 2024 and beyond, but I don't have to tell you that. Well, what of the historic female black first vice president uh, who happens to be both of those things? What did Kamala Harris have to say? What profundity did she have to offer on yesterday this hallowed day of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. If you ever question your reason for being, what is your purpose, whether it matters, and I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, the answer will come when you realize the impact you can have on another human being. Now, she's at George Washington University I don't know who her audience is, to be fair, because I haven't seen the actual video, but I would assume at George Washington University, it's not toddlers, right? No. <laughs> Why does she sound like she's talking to your child, who's three? Like, if she were on bended knee talking to little Eddie this way, I would understand it. She's talking to, ostensibly, I would guess, 20-somethings or older professors? Yeah. Yeah. If you ever question your reason for being, the answer will come when you realize the impact that you can have on a nut. Oh. So not only is it platitudinal dreck, a bunch of word salad, it's said in the most childish, condescending voice. My wife has a unique disdain for that woman. I mean, a unique disdain. Every time I play, it's like I, the fastest way to irritate my wife and I know many ways. But the fastest way is whenever I see one of Kamala Harris's profundities pop up, I'll always turn up my phone and then just play it. And she will start to con con convulse and twitch. That woman, I can't get you. She, it makes her so angry to listen to her just say a bunch of empty nothing. More than anyone else in politics. I'm not kidding. San Francisco's Reparations Committee. It, it, yesterday was pandering day. So in addition to uh, singing happy birthday to uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter-in-law, but not really knowing her name, got a little of that again. I never tire of hearing that. Martin Luther, we celebrate a legacy of your beloved father and mother. They work for the beloved community. But congratulations today to the honorees, uh, including your wife, uh, who I understand, uh, is it birthday today? Well, look, my wife has a rule in her family. When somebody's birthday, sing happy birthday. You ready? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Oh. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Valley. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Father. Oh, boy, don't we? That must have warmed her heart to hear the President of the United States call her by name, Father. Happy birthday, Father. 
So on this uh, day of pandering yesterday, San Francisco politicians and their reparations committee proposed paying each black longtime resident. What is a longtime resident by definition? I'd like to know. How do you how do you qualify as a longtime resident? Five million dollars and granting total debt forgiveness due to the decades of systemic repression faced by the local black community. The San Francisco African American Reparations Advisory Committee advising the city on developing a plan for reparations for black residents released its draft report last month to address reparations, not for slavery, since California was not technically a slave state. <laughs> That's a little hiccup to the problem, but okay, fine. Uh, to address the public policies explicitly created to subjugate black people in San Francisco by upholding and expanding the intent and legacy of chattel slavery. The intent? Upholding and expanding the intent. Wow. Now cities are going to have to pay. You as a taxpayer may have to pay for something your community didn't even participate in historically. But you had intent. That's quite a slope to slide down. Reparations for what you perceive. As, that reminds me of the warning on shows, historical smoking. What is historical intent? While neither San Francisco nor California formally adopted the institution of chattel slavery, the tenets of segregation, white supremacy, and systemic repression and exclusion of black people were codified through legal and uh, other actions, social codes, and judicial enforcement. The draft plan includes a long list of financial recommendations for black San Francisco residents, including a one-time lump sum payment of $5 million to each eligible individual. Well, I'm sure California can afford it. Good luck to the people of San Francisco. Meanwhile, uh, more pandering over at MSNBC. The white Nicole Wallace talking with Dr. Jason Jones about voter ID and how racist it is. And, and I remember Republicans called me after 2020 and they said, well, what kind of voter integrity law would, would you be happy with? I said, none. There isn't any voter fraud and it's already a crime. We have criminal statutes in every state and every locality and at the federal level. If you vote illegally, it's a crime. And you know who commits those crimes? Republicans, Trump voters. So how do we inject reality and how do we make the democracy agenda? I mean, it's it's insane to me that only Democrats are fighting for voting rights in America. How do we make that? How do you take the partisanship out of access to the polls? I don't think you can take partisanship out of it because really the partisanship is just a proxy for racism. I mean, like, let, let's be clear. When, when you have voter suppression laws in a let's place be like clear, Ohio, I'm about to lie. You, you have, and we've seen this sociologically, that there's a certain segment of white people in America who would rather have their own lives inconvenienced than run the risk of black people being on an equal plane. Because frankly, all these voter suppression laws, they hurt white people too. Right. The, the intention is to keep black people from voting, but it inconveniences everybody. I am very sure that somebody living in Lorraine, Ohio, doesn't like the fact that their ID cards and things don't work the way they used to as well. I see. So the intent of you showing ID, you crackers out there who support voter ID, you're actually inconveniencing yourself. You're you're so committed to not letting black people vote, you'd inconvenience yourself. You'd make it a pain in your own keister just to keep blacks from voting. Never mind that in Georgia it had universal support and they had high, with new voter integrity and voter ID laws on the books in Georgia, they had a higher voter attendance than ever before for the last two election cycles. It's kept no one from voting. Blacks or any other demographic. It's a lie. It's a complete and utter lie. By the way, Nicole Wallace said there's no voter fraud and the only voter fraud is committed by Republicans. We have criminal statutes in every state and every locality at the federal level. You can't vote illegally. It's a crime. I wonder if Nicole feels that way about guns. So every time a Democrat comes along and wants to pass a new gun law, and we say, we already have laws on the books to govern guns. What do they say? Loopholes, loopholes, loopholes. If they talked about guns the same way they talk about votes, they'd be consistent. 
plurality of younger U.S. voters are registering as independents. This from Breitbart, a plurality of young people registering independent, according to Gallup. The report authored by Jeffrey Jones showed that younger voters appear to be rejecting the two main political parties and are identifying as independents. Currently, Americans are evenly split uh, split between Democrats and Republicans at 28 percent. A plurality, 41 percent, identify as independent. We've talked about this before, this brand of independent and what this means. I used to be kind of leery of people that called themselves independent because to me it used to always mean I'm the smartest guy in the room. I can take all positions on all sides at all times. I'm independent. It's still a crutch for a lot of people who say it. But I'm beginning to understand why, so, like, um, you know, when somebody says, oh, Stigall's a big Republican, I'm always quick to correct them. I said, no, I'm a big conservative. I typically vote with the Republicans. There is a distinction. But I'd never call myself independent. I mean, I always clarify being a Republican has to be earned. If you want me to vote Republican, you got to earn it. So I don't wear an R on my chest with an allegiance to the party. Will I vote for that party most of the time? In fact, I, there's never been a time I haven't voted for the Republican Party. That's true. And I know there's some libertarians or independents out there that say, well, that's part of the problem. You got to get out of that. Well, until there's a viable option, a real viable option, um, you know, I, it's there is no option. So I've never been a third party guy. But you know, if it gets there, so be it. And, you know, it's not not my job to lead it. I've always, I've lamented this argument that somehow it's any one of our jobs to start spearheading, you know, a movement for a third party. No, I mean, if there's legitimate, genuine traction out there, then someone with organizational skills will tap into it and start fundraising and it will grow. But it's not going to be because you're, you know, your neighbor Jim decides he, I'm an independent, follow me. And then all of a sudden he's going to grow a national movement. It's never worked. I'm, I've yet to see it work. But I understand why people are leery to call themselves Republican. I certainly understand why you'd be leery to call yourself Democrat. But most of the time, independent used to mean I'm a Democrat, but I don't want to own everything that's crazy about the Democrats. And I, I want... People that called themselves independent used to be the ones that would say, I'm a fiscal conservative, but on social issues, I, I, I'm a moderate or liberal. I don't. It's none of my business what you do in the bedroom. I'm a fiscal conservative, though. Meaning Sodom and Gomorrah can be happening all around them, but uh, they care a lot about the budget. I never, <laughs> never understood. But anyway, like I know what independent means now, particularly with young people. They don't like labels. Okay, fine. So this Gallup report taken before the midterms, millennials and Gen X, the largest contributors as to why a plurality now identify as independents. Over half of millennials call themselves independent. 44% call themselves independent in Generation X. That's my age group. Baby boomers, only 33%. And then 26% of the silent generation. The report indicates that in the early 90s, shortly after Gallup started to conduct these interviews, independents began to outnumber Republicans and Democrats. But the advantage faded in the early 2000s until 2009, when identifying as an independent had grown and reached levels not seen before. Hmm. 2000s until 2009. In August... The report says historical patterns of Americans having a weak attachment to a party during young adulthood before likely identifying with either Democrat or Republican Party later in life. But more recently, it's appeared to change with Gen X and millennials who are now approaching or are middle aged. Jones noted that they have maintained or even expanded their identification as political independence in recent decades. The 2022 numbers the report used represented a one-point increase for the GOP since 2021 and a one-point decrease for Democrats. In 2022, the report also notes it was the ninth time in the last 35 years Democrats did not hold at least a 2% more than Republican advantage. So, what does that mean? Well, we're looking down the barrel of a new party chair. On the Republican side, I say we, those of us that vote Republican, you're conservative and the Republican Party is the only viable option at the moment. 
Uh, we're staring down the barrel of electing a new chair, and Rana Romney McDaniel wants another go at it. The woman that has presided over the 2020 and 2022 miserable failures wants it again. Um, I don't see another way to tackle this, but to just be straight up honest with you about it, I do not, and I would ask those of you who are Trump enthusiasts to weigh in on this, I do not understand why Donald Trump is headlong all in for Ronna Romney McDaniel for another term, but he is. Can anyone explain to me why the woman that presided over his election loss and then a really, really pitiful midterm, well, law, other than the House, pretty pitiful midterm losses, why would Donald Trump support another round of Ronna Romney McDaniel? He is. Our friend Harmeet Dillon is out there leading a very legitimate challenge, and the good news is that there's heavy support amongst Republican voters for her. Not that they're ultimately who's going to vote for this. Every state has three party leaders that go to the Republican conference and collectively each state and these three people in each state. By the way, the three Republicans from Pennsylvania we have specifically contacted, none of them want to chat, interestingly. We have seen that some Republicans in the South, these three from states like Florida and Texas and other places, have come out publicly and said, it's time for a change. Wouldn't surprise me, though, if we find out that our three Republican representatives in Pennsylvania have decided Ron is just fine. But again, I point out to you, pains me to say it, Donald Trump believes Ron is fine. A recent poll of over 1,000 Republican voters found that 86% would support Harmeet Dillon as the new RNC chair over Ronna McDaniel. The era of a status quo Republican Party is over, whether those clinging to power realize it yet or not. A recent Trafalgar poll of just over 1,000 potential Republican voters found that 86% of respondents support Harmeet Dillon as a new party chairperson. My colleague Charlie Kirk tweeted a recent poll of 1,000 Republicans found 86% would support Harmeet Dillon over Ronna McDaniel. And uh, he's the one that quote is attributed to. The Republican Party needs to realize the status quo era is over. Those clinging to power may not realize it yet, but it's over. Ronna McDaniel... Elected in 2017, running for her fourth term, received 14% support. The president of the Convention of States, Mark Meckler, who we've had on the show, he says the era of establishment is over. The grassroots are pushing back, making their voices heard. And contrary to what Ronna McDaniel has stated publicly, the leadership of the RNC should ultimately reflect the will of the Republican voter and move Republicans forward at the ballot box. Now, um, why do I bring up these two stories? So if we know that younger and younger people are starting to register as independents, and we have a party chair election coming up, why are those two pieces of information important at the same time? Well, because we got to figure out where to go find these newly registered independents. People my age and younger are now increasingly not calling themselves members of any party. There's only one way to take advantage of people my age and younger continuing to register as independent. Here's a hint. Younger people want to work from home now. <laughs> we found that out in the COVID era. Nobody wants to drive into work anymore. They don't want an office building. Everybody wants to zoom in for meetings and Stay at home. Okay, fine. People want to have their groceries delivered at home. Grubhub. Instacart. I dare say that a lot of young people... Look, if my son, who just turned 18 on Sunday, by the way, he's now a legal voter. If I just left my son to his own devices right now, he would vote for Republicans. He would. I'm confident when I say that. But if I said, go find your polling place... <laughs> My 18-year-old my son not only doesn't know what a polling place is, he wouldn't know how to find it. 
If I just left him to his own devices and didn't help him along, of course, which I would, but I'm just saying most people don't know where their polling place is, and it's too much trouble. People don't want to go get, you know, food. They'd rather have it delivered to their front door. What's my point? What do Democrats do well that Republicans suck at at present? Ballot harvesting. Door knocking. Going where the voters are. I remind you that in Pennsylvania, for instance, we are now conducting elections a full two months ahead of Election Day. Did Ronna Romney McDaniel, in your estimation, uh, succeed in going to find these people who don't want to turn out on Election Day but would rather vote ahead of time, mail in their vote? Did she succeed at that? She loves to talk about turnout on Election Day. Ronna loves to talk about how we really swamped them on Election Day, as if that matters anymore. I remind you again when people say, how in the world is that John Fetterman a senator? I'll tell you how. He got 700,000 votes cast for him before Election Day even happened. That's how. And how does that happen? That happens because the Democrat Party understands something the Republican Party at present does not. Ballot harvesting, ballot collection is the name of the game now. Harmy Dillon understands that. Ronna McDaniel does not. She's still thumping her chest and wants kudos and attagirls for big turnout on Election Day, as if that matters. Election Day no longer matters in at least two-thirds of this country. By the way, I got confirmation on this from a very good friend in politics who, uh, who has run many a national campaign for Republicans. And I said to him, and I was just speaking with him, and I said, hey, I just want to be sure that you're on the same page that I am on this. Do you believe that our single biggest problem with elections and the thing we've really got to get better at as Republican voters is collecting ballots ahead of time, the early vote? Well, I'll just tell you who it is because you've heard him on the show. I had him as part of the Harump Society recently. Jeff Rose his name. I was talking with Jeff. Not a secret. Uh, Jeff ran Ted Cruz's campaign. Jeff also ran Glenn Youngkin's campaign successfully in Virginia. I said, is it? Do you agree? Because Jeff's a very kind of like steely-eyed guy. And I think often the hyperbole of what goes on in media is not political reality for those people. You know, they, they think and see data in a different way than maybe we often talk about. And they have things to think about and consider that we don't always see. So sometimes, you know, I'll bring something up that I'm thinking and he'll say, no, that's not, you know, I know that's what everyone's saying, but the reality is this. And here's the data I have to back that up. Right. So he'll disabuse me quickly if it's just something I'm emotionally whipped up about and I run it up the flagpole. But I said, I'm right. Right. That we're collecting ballots two months before Election Day. Democrats are. And that's the biggest problem we have. He said, without a doubt. I said, OK, so. When you guys in Virginia running Glenn Youngkin's campaign, and I know this because my colleague Larry O'Connor, by the way, I was on Larry's show last night on the, the Salem News Channel to launch the new Salem podcast. I appreciated the invite. But Larry, you know, he's down there in the Delmarva region. Is that what they call that? Delaware, yeah, Maryland, a, Virginia. Such a weird... Delmarva. Yeah. They say Delmarva like we say Delaware Valley in the region. It's just such a weird... I don't know when that happened. But anyway... Um, because Larry broadcasts, you know, the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, a lot of potential Glenn Youngkin voters are there on his show, obviously, and a lot of Washington, D.C. swamp dwellers live in Virginia. So Youngkin's campaign spent a lot of time on Larry's show. And in fact, the first, uh, the first full day of election season is mid-September or something in Virginia, or election day in early November. Kicks off in Virginia in, I think, mid to late September. So he goes on Larry's show and he says, hey, just so you know, you can vote today. Grab your ballot. Get out and vote. Start to vote today. And they hit that and they hit that and they hit that. So the Glenn Youngkin campaign in Virginia started campaigning hard in media and running ads telling voters, his voters, vote for me starting right now. Don't wait. Go get your ballot and go vote. Did you hear anybody, for instance, in Pennsylvania, and I, Pennsylvania, I'm not singling out Pennsylvania as the only one, because it was far from the only one. 
There are many states that have this early voting. And I can't speak for all of them. I can speak for Pennsylvania. Did you hear any Pennsylvania Republicans saying, get out there and grab your ballot now. Let us know how we can come to you with a ballot right now. You can vote right now. Did you ever hear that? I didn't. I heard election day is coming. Election day is coming. The red coats are coming. It's like Paul Revere, a buggy whip. It's so antiquated. And I know that makes some of you mad. That's the way it should be. I know that's the way it should be. And everyone should be on church on Sundays too. But the reality is we can now cast votes two months before election day. And that's not going to go away. Harmy Dillon understands that. Ronna McDaniel is still running around doing end zone dances about turnout on election day. So, again, I remind you, if young people, people my age and younger, not exactly young, but middle-aged people and younger are growing in independent classification, and we know, you know, that bring it to me thing, have it my way, the Burger King deal, uh, we want it our way, delivered to us in our laps, Remember what Dick Morris said, Republicans have couch potatoes too. We have to figure out where are these people and how do we get ballots in their hands to vote for us? Because Democrats do have the advantage here. They can go to a college campus and round up as many votes as they need. We don't, conservative-minded people don't cluster. You don't find them in cloistered communities, college campuses and things like that. It's going to take more work. There's no doubt about it. But a new strategy is necessary, which is why it's beyond me that Donald Trump, of all people, is an enthusiast of Ronna McDaniels. But look, <laughs> Trump has also said repeatedly, we have to end mail-in voting. And I respect that, and I appreciate that, and I know that it's full of fraud. Of course it is. But there's nothing we're going to do about it. So where Republicans have played the game, they are winning. I, I remind you again, in California and New York, the pickups in the House were in California and New York in the midterms. The reason Republicans have a narrow lead in the House right now are bizarrely because of Republicans playing the game finally in California and New York. That is proof positive that if you figure out how to play this game, you can play it and you can win it. I spent time with people over the weekend telling them, and it was so amazing, Republican voters still don't all process this. It, it, because we want to believe in Election Day. We want to believe in election integrity. We don't want to hear anything about drop boxes and mail-in voting and vote harvesting. We don't like that. I don't either. But when I say to these, I, I was with it was amazing to watch their faces as though I was saying something profound. I wasn't. But to them, it was. They said, what are we going to do, Chris? What are we going to do? We just can't seem to overcome these Democrats. I said, we've got to learn to vote early. We've got to learn to val ballot harvest like Democrats do. And you could see them go, hmm. Yeah. I would explain, we're not going to get rid of early voting. We're not going to get rid of mail-in voting, so let's learn how to play the game. And there were a couple of guys. One guy was in his 70s, diehard conservative Republican voter. And, I mean, by the end of the weekend I was with him, he, he was pounding, yeah, Chris is right. we got to learn to play their game and collect those ballots early. He'd never really been told that, though, is my point. It's not that I'm, I'm not, you know, it's not like I was, you know, some oracle. He's just all his life believed Election Day matters, and that's it. He'd never been told by someone, there's a new game, and we've got to learn to play it. And he was like, you're right, damn it. Yeah, we got to vote early. That's got to happen across the country. That conversation has got to happen with every Republican voter. And that starts with a new party chair who appreciates and understands the importance of it. And Ronna McDaniel does not. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.